Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see we've already got 73 of you joined. Um, sorry, we're a couple of minutes late, as is the world of lockdown and using things like Microsoft Teams. Two of our speakers haven't managed to join yet. I'm immensely grateful to our other speaker, Chris Sharp, who's very kindly agreed to be the first speaker rather than the order he was in. So the order may change, but the topic doesn't and the content won't. And it's great to have you here today. This is a really important topic. What I'd like to do is just move to the next slide, please, with a bit of housekeeping and, and then I'll do more of an introduction. I'm Simon Gregory, I'm the Deputy Medical Director for Primary and Integrated Care and in a moment share why as a GP this is such an important topic for me. But then three colleagues hopefully will be joining, Dr Kalpa Karicha, the Head of Research Policy and Practice at the Campaign to End Loneliness, Chris Sharp, the Workforce Development Lead colleague from Public Health England, and Gay Palmer, Social Prescribing Link Worker from the National Academy of Social Prescribing. And I've got to be really uh, honest, I'm so pleased to have a Social Prescribing Link Worker on here. When SPLWs were first introduced to the GP contract, I wasn't sure what they would do, I wasn't sure of the evidence. It's been one of the most important developments as a GP that my patients are now able to get help with many of the factors that are impacting on their lives with the social determinants of health and it's making such a difference. Can we move to the next slide please? This is obviously on Microsoft Teams, hence we're having a little bit of difficulty getting some people into Microsoft Teams. Please use the live Q&A function. You should see along the top of your taskbar, you'll see the two people for the participants emblem, the chat, and then a little question mark in a speech bubble. That's the Q&A. The chat function doesn't work for delegates attending. It's the Q&A yeah. function. If you put questions into that, then we will get those questions and, they'll, and I will put them to the speakers. And we'll try and address those that were submitted in advance of today yeah. as well. The session is being recorded and will be made available to watch again at your leisure. Next slide, please. Chris is back. So the order will change in that Chris is going to talk about the making every contact count approach. Then we'll have Kalpa and Gay on tackling loneliness and social isolation and tackling loneliness with social prescribing. And hopefully we'll have some time for um, questions and answers. So next slide, please. So really important topic. As a GP, I recognise this. It's a very real social, societal and health problem. It really does impact on those we are here to serve. Five to 10% of people in the UK say that they are often or always lonely. I've okay. recently done the e-learning for healthcare's module on this and I have to say it's as you would expect of e-learning for healthcare it's absolutely excellent and I do recommend it to you all. What I'd like to do is hand over to, to Chris and ask Chris if you would introduce yourself and then take it from there. Thank you. Thank you Simon. My name is Chris Sharp. I'm the Workforce Development Lead for PHE in Yorkshire and the Humber and I'm delighted to be talking to you today on this highly important webinar to talk about using the MEC approach to tackle social isolation and loneliness. Uh, next slide, please. Now, first things first, what is MEC? So MEC is an abbreviation of an approach to behaviour change called Making Every Contact Count. At the heart of this approach is an opportunity to utilise the millions of day-to-day -day interactions that we all have in health and care to make a positive difference to someone's health, someone's physical or mental well-being. MEC is typically associated with conversations around smoking cessation or alcohol reduction, but it can equally be applied to loneliness. Next slide, please. Just wanted to do a quick plug alongside Simon for the new e-learning course that we have on tackling social isolation and loneliness. It covers how we understand why people can experience social isolation and loneliness at different points in their life. One thing that we're really keen to stress within the course is that loneliness isn't focused on older age adults. It can run throughout the life course and we have some powerful human impact stories that are built into the e-learning course itself, 
with some fantastic colleagues from a, a company called Halo Theatre who have reenacted some human impact stories, you could say. But actually, the bit I wanted to talk to you about today was the understanding of how we can use the MEC approach to combat social isolation and loneliness, one conversation at a time. So this course isn't an awareness course. It's more of a call to action, hence the tackling social isolation and loneliness as the title. Just a reminder that people don't choose to be lonely. You can be surrounded by people and still feel lonely. If you don't have connections you aspire to have, you, you will get that feeling of loneliness, whereas some that, have, that actually are alone can be perfectly happy with this. There is enough research available now uh, to say that actually that people who are lonely can find it difficult to open up about this. But the good news is you can help. Next slide, please. I wanted to play a video where the primary conversation is about falls awareness. Here we've got the practice nurse who seeks to address that the patient has indicated some feelings of loneliness. And so if we could play that and hopefully we'll, we'll get some sound in our work. Thank you. So there you go, Ravi. That's your leg dressed. Oh, thanks very much for that. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about what happened? Well, I fell over. Silly, really. Oh, it's not silly. Did you trip over anything? I don't know. I was coming out of kitchen into lounge. And next thing I find myself on the floor. It must be the rug that tripped me over. I can't blame the cat because he wasn't there. Do you think it'd be worse when you get home taking your rug up? You know, I, I, I'll check what happened, yes. Yeah, so and having I'll a look around, look see around. if you've anything else you might trip over. Have you fallen before? Tell you the truth, I have fallen a few times, but I haven't hurt myself. Mm. And since my wife died in February, I don't go out much. Uh, I don't know what would happen if I fall outside. Mm. You know, what will happen to me? Well, I'll tell you what we can do if you want. We could make an appointment to come and see the healthcare assistant. That way they can talk all about falls and falls prevention. And I've got a little booklet here you can take home with you if you want. It tells you all about how to reduce your risk of falls and how to get up if you do fall. And they will also tell you about something called social prescribing. Have you ever heard about that? Uh, not really. Yeah. Okay, so social prescribing is a service that we can refer you to and then someone from the service will be in touch, they'll come and meet you and then they'll tell you about all the services that are available in the local area. So, for example, lunch clubs or day centres, any hobby clubs that you might fancy doing so you can get out and meet people a little bit more and you won't feel quite so isolated. Well, sounds a good idea. Do you think that? Do you think that? Yeah, be I'm a, as I said, you know, I have been thinking about it, but I haven't done anything about it because I don't like bothering people. No, it's no bother. Shall I make an appointment now, and then we can get the ball rolling, and then hopefully we can get you out and about a little bit. Oh, that would be great. Thanks very much. I'm hoping that you heard that. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure that you did. Essentially, this was a practice nurse who uh, had a conversation, hopefully you've heard that, that uh, they have, have talked to the patient about uh, their feelings of loneliness and they will have essentially referred the patient that they had on to their social prescri prescribing service and you're going to be hearing more about that later. So the MEC approach ultimately uses a behaviour change called a very brief intervention. And if you can have the next slide, please. So a very brief intervention uh, is, has been defined by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence as a conversation that can be between 30 seconds and a couple of minutes. And the very brief intervention helps people to raise awareness, motivate and sign people to improve their health and well-being. In simple terms, this uses an ask, assist and act approach. Next slide, please. So in terms of the ask approach, we're essentially establishing what's happening and these are exploring type questions. So the 
obviously we we're acknowledging that actually there's some difficulty with people opening up about loneliness. So we could ask some questions around what do you like to do with your spare time? What hobbies and interests do you have? How often would you say that you take part in hobbies or social activities? How do you feel about you spend it, how well you spend the time? And how would you describe your network of friends and family? So the kind of top tips on this is conversation starters, essentially using questions that start with the what, how, where, when and why. So these are just very brief questions that we can start to get that conversation and, and gain that confidence with an individual. Next slide, please. So the next part is the assist aspect in terms of what solutions are there. So that would be how would you like things to be? What would you like to be doing differently and how would you feel about that? What would you what would make a positive difference to you? And are there people who would model what you would like to be doing and how you would like to do it? And what needs to happen to make that change take place? Essentially, this takes a, a what matters to you approach. We can all support people to find their own ways of addressing their feelings of loneliness. And on slide nine, if you can go to the next slide, please. Is the act. So that's what must I do? So most people need some kind of social contact, but everybody has different social needs. A person may have very few friends, but actually don't need essentially a large group of acquaintances, acquaintances to feel satisfied. State that the simplest way is to find a way of easing feelings of loneliness so they can try and meet more people and, and different people as well. They can think of anything that they've got an interest in. For example, this may be a class or a group that they've heard of that could help connect them with new people. And there are a myriad of different voluntary organisations out there that offer things like befriending services, social dining, hobby crafts, special interest connections, etc. And again, you'll hear a bit more about them as we go along with the presentation, especially on the social prescribing side. So on slide 10, I would like to play another video. Essentially, I'd like you to spot within this process the Ask Assistant Act process in this very simple conversation. Next slide, we've got a bit of a scenario where we've got a pharmacist talking to a customer, if you could play that, thank you. I've not seen you for a while. How have you been? Fine. Well, I've been better, to be honest. I've, I've not really been out quite a while since I got made redundant. You're the, you're the first person I've seen for quite a few days. Am I? Right. What about family and friends? I get texts from the kids, but I don't see them that much. You know how it is. And I, I don't see uh, work colleagues either. They've all moved on, different site and that. Is there anything that you'd like to be doing differently? I just miss work, I suppose. You know, being a joiner, I, I miss doing the practical stuff, making things and yeah. fixing stuff. That's what I miss most, really. Yeah. Have you heard of Men in Sheds? Men in Sheds? Yeah, it's a group of like-minded guys that get together, connect, and do things like woodwork and carpentry. I'm sure they'd really appreciate your skills. If you'd like to get in touch with them, I can give you the contact details. Oh, I'd like to find out a bit more, yeah. I'll give you their information, and you can give them a call whenever's best for you. Okay, well, I'll maybe try them tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Fantastic, thank you. So I'm going to get, skip over the next couple of slides because uh, these are mainly for reference and I'm sure we'll send out the presentations after this particular event. But I just wanted to acknowledge that signposting is quite a challenge, but there are many fantastic services that are out there embedded in our local communities, run by the third sector and staffed by a dedicated army of volunteers. Social prescribers have this knowledge and they're key to supporting this. Next slide, please. Just a few examples of the types of services that are likely to be available in your local community. I always try to encourage as much as possible for people to understand what is available locally. Quite often these are not commissioned services, but they could be something right around the corner in your local community. And if you can get to know what these are, it helps uh, enable that so signposting conversations to happen. But again, our social prescribers have a fantastic knowledge of some of these services that are available. And finally, for me, is the last slide. And for me, it's the most important video. So beyond all the stats are people and together 
we can create connections to tackle social isolation and loneliness. And with this particular example, I want to see, well, I want to demonstrate really what sort of difference those social co uh, connections can make. Thank you. The befriending service is so simple and unique. There are so many lonely, isolated older people. And what we do is we match those lonely, isolated people with a volunteer from their area who will commit to visit once a week, just for a cup of tea and a natter, basically. The day I met her, it was just like we clicked straight away. So I come see her once or twice a week. Sometimes I might even make it three times if she's lucky. In my spare time, I just come and see her. There's that many different elderly people that are isolated and stuck in house that just need a friend and I'm there to be it, so good company. Oh, she's great. My friends have died. So it's like having a best friend again. Making friends, I like to make friends. I like to meet people and have a chat. I come chatting to you now. It's a friendship now and Glenys has got a new friend. They're sharing the stories with each other now and just having that new person in her life to look forward to coming each week has made such a difference. It's a great thing that they've done for old age because it's the thing that old age really wants. You know, just to have contact with somebody else is great and having them in your house. It makes a difference to her life, knowing how lonely she is. I can walk in, she can be sad, saying I've had a bad night. I can walk out, she can be giggling and feel better. Then she'll be like, when you come in again? But yeah, she's lovely. <laughs> I'm 84 in April, so I live for today. If I, I wished I'd have known about it before. Did you feel quite lonely before then? Yeah. Well, I'm, I was sat in the house. I was crying all the time. And you see, you brought love into my life. Thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that video because I think it is potentially really powerful. And I'd like to thank as well an organisation in Doncaster called Befriend for lining that up as well. They do a fantastic job in their local community. But that's it for me. And hopefully, Simon, I've got somebody to pass on to. We have indeed. I'm very pleased Fantastic. that Kelper and Gay have been able to join. So um, if we could hand over to Kelper now. Thank you, Chris, for stepping in and covering so gallantly. You're very welcome. Colleagues, I'm really grateful to you for persisting. The technology really isn't on our side today, and I'm so sorry for this. The team are working hard to try and get Calper in. I, I wonder, Chris, if you would mind coming back off mute for a bit and you and I start with some of the questions. You talked about the making every contact count and that from the uh, smoking point of view, but it felt like it was something that any of us could use, not just in, in consultations or with a pharmacist or a GP or whatever, but, but even that we could use it with friends and family has there been anything uh, uh, about applying it in that way? Yes, Simon. Hopefully you can see on your screen, actually, just underneath there, there's a link to MechLink as well. Essentially, we want to look at a number of conversation starters uh, just to try and engage somebody with a conversation as naturally as possible. But the only thing that we're asking people to do is slightly structure it to actually prize out some of the, the key aspects of that conversation. So these are conversations we would have. In fact, most people will have on a daily basis, but we won't necessarily give them a label like making every contact count. The only thing we're doing is saying, rather than talk about the holidays, is to talk about things that may come up in conversation. So if somebody has indicated that they may be lonely, we can ask about some of the social contacts that they've already got. We could ask them what really matters to them, and then we can potentially assist them in terms of finding what might be a useful solution for them, whether it's an external organisation in terms of meeting new people or it's establishing contacts that they already have and making the most use of that. 
the act part is just that actually at the end of this conversation we need to be reasonably comfortable that we're okay to maybe signpost people to either a support service or to encourage people to make those contacts that they've already got it should be a natural conversation it's some it shouldn't be something that people need training for it should be something that arguably we do on a kind of day-to-day basis and it also doesn't need to be health and social care staff that kind of do that we can all have these conversations Great, thank you. And in particular, I, when I did the, the module, I was quite struck by the age ranges that were being affected. I think I'd come at it with a, a prejudice that it would be the elderly that would be lonely, especially bereaved. But I was particularly taken by the case study of the university student and seeing mm-hmm. 16 to 24 year olds are also affected. Does MET work for, for them also? It, it does. We've included the the kind of student experience because, again, there's a perception a student is going out to this fantastic new world. They're going to meet new friends. They're just going to be parties all the time with lots of new people. And that might be the reality for quite a number of students. But for others, it could be incredibly isolating. Not everybody has that fantastic student experience. So we're, we're trying to stay that actually that people can experience loneliness at different points in life. It may there be some stigma associated. You, I'm supposed to have a fantastic experience. Why aren't I? Is it because I'm not able to to make new friends? Do I feel a bit funny about that? We try and show how other people can step in. There may be a conversation that you could start, for example, on the e-learning course. This is between a tutor and the students about you know what interests they have, and they end up lining them up with a kind of one of the kind of interest groups that they have at university and then suddenly they're flying they're making new contacts and they're really broadening their social connections so yeah we really were really careful that actually this e-learning course wasn't focused on purely older people and i'm sure if calpers on later she'll talk about that actually social isolation can take point uh, place at any different point in life and at various different circumstances in life you know as, as we face different challenges all the way through it no, thank you. It's really helpful. I think um, the last 18 months or about 16 to 18 months has been unique in the, in the experience of everyone in probably globally, but certainly in the UK with lockdowns, um, even with bubbles and working from home. And that I, I wonder if that's led to more people feeling socially isolated and potentially lonely. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess there's no doubt that actually lockdowns and people that in shielding throughout this process has, has increased social isolation and loneliness. One of the things that I do is I volunteer for the Royal Voluntary Service and right from the start of the pandemic, we were encouraged to do some food parcels which was really good. But actually, when I would pop those food parcels, they didn't want, they didn't, it wasn't that, that they wanted to get the connections back. So for people that did the dancing groups or the knit and natters, you know, it wasn't the knitting they wanted, it was the natter. And we have essentially had to prevent people from doing that. So I know that things like the Royal Voluntary Service have done things like telephone befriending and, and all sorts of other things in between. But we hopefully will get to a stage now where people will have the confidence in the vaccine and organisations will be able to start putting those aspects back. But it will take time and we have lost, we've lost a period of time where people, are, you know, that sort of isolation and the work that's been done in that particular area has been put back a number of years potentially. You know, so we do need to get that confidence back and trying to get those connections established as much as possible. But people have been doing some fantastic jobs in, in the meantime. That's brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for holding the fort. Uh, um, I think that Kelpa has now managed to join. I think the perseverance of everybody today is showing uh, how committed everyone is to addressing loneliness and social isolation. Uh, and all credit to you for that voluntary work as well. I'm sure it's made such a, a difference. Can you hear me and can we hear you? I can hear you, Simon. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Kalpa Karicha from the Campaign to End Loneliness, and I'm delighted to finally be part of this event today. It's been brilliant to be part of this work with others. It's such an important tool, and the campaign's really pleased to have been involved. Next slide, please. We do have your next slide, Kalpa. Okay, there's a delay with what I'm seeing. I'll just presume after next slide that, that you've moved on. So. For those of you that uh, don't know the campaign, we are part of the What Works Centre for Wellbeing and we work 
to address loneliness across all ages. And we've worked in this area since 2011. Our main areas of focus are on developing and sharing the evidence on loneliness, working collaboratively with other organisations and campaigning for action. And of course, loneliness and isolation have been studied for many decades, but over the last 10 years or so, it's really been brought to the fore of public attention as we've recognised uh, what a public health issue loneliness is and the importance of quality social connections for our health and well-being. And now, of course, we have a Minister for Loneliness and Loneliness Strategies in, in three of the four nations and a huge amount of work has gone on the ground across sectors and with a variety of stakeholders. Next slide, please. I think it's always helpful to define what we mean when we talk about loneliness and social isolation. So loneliness is subjective. Its causes and how it's experienced will be different for different people. But across this variation, loneliness is defined as an unwelcome feeling when we have a gap between the social connections that we want and the ones that we have. This is different from social isolation because that's an objective measure of the number of contacts or interactions we have. These can be counted. Of course, the two are very much related. So social isolation increase your risk of loneliness. And it also means that we can't reduce loneliness by just increasing the number or the frequency of contacts we have. What really matters is the quality of these connections. That's the key difference between the two. Next slide, please. So loneliness is an emotion that we all experience, and that's really important to recognize. There's great variety, though, in how it can be experienced. It can vary in how often we experience these negative feelings, how long they last, and how intense they are. So if we have an intensity of feeling that's relatively short-lived, it can actually be helpful because it can motivate us to connect and reconnect with other people. It's a sign that we need to do something and that can be helpful. But the difference is when loneliness becomes chronic and severe, when people feel lonely often or always, this is when it starts to inhibit our social connections and starts to cause harm. And we know that about 5-10% to of people often or always feel lonely. It's actually a bit higher in younger people that's been in more recent evidence. And about 40% of people feel loneliness on occasion. Next slide, please. So I've talked about loneliness as this unwanted feeling, a negative emotion, but what do we mean? Here are some words that people have used to describe how loneliness makes them feel. And as you can see, there are some very powerful expressions and emotions in these words. Okay, next slide, please. So it's really important to recognize the impact of these feelings and what these feelings can impact on if you experience them over time. And key to this is the loss of confidence that can go alongside them. This loss of confidence can influence how we behave and make us withdraw even further from other people, which can be the, the irony of it, withdraw from the sources of relief of loneliness quite often. So in turn, this can set off a downward spiral where there's more negative thoughts and feelings, more intense feelings of loneliness, and even longer periods of isolation. And all of this together can make loneliness much harder to shift. Next slide, please. So to stop loneliness becoming chronic, we need to recognize the risk factors. And unfortunately, we know a lot about this. There are factors at the individual, the demographic level, such as age, you know, that loneliness is highest and has peaks in adolescence and in later life, which interestingly reflect at times of life when we're either trying to build our social relationships or a time when we're often losing our networks and losing um, many of our relationships. Other risk factors are be belonging to a minority group, being a carer, others are related to socioeconomic factors like income, deprivation, 
and the related impact that this has on exclusion. There's also health factors, particularly when your health stops you doing what you want, in particularly if it stops you leaving your home. There are structural factors, the infrastructure in our society, the transport that can be inaccessible, the quality of our built environment, how safe we feel, the many aspects of digital technology which can help and hinder our social connections, all your attitudes around ageism and, and how that can impact how we expect to feel or how others perceive us, particularly as we age. Next slide, please. We also know that life events and transitions are really key, can be really key risk factors. And these are common life events that we all experience, but they can result in a change in our relationships, our roles and our identity, and can commonly evoke feelings of loss. And it can also be about our expectations of what life should be like when it doesn't match what our experience is like at that stage. And again, these can be concentrated at particular times of life, and at times they can accumulate like they can do in later life. And the e-learning course, as I think I heard Chris talk about earlier, has got some brilliant accounts of key transitions around leaving home and starting university, new parenthood, divorce, bereavement, and disability that the Halo Theatre Company has presented really well. Next slide, please. So loneliness and health, this is really key. Whilst I've said that loneliness is an, an emotion that we all experience and it's important not to medicalize it, there is an increasing body of evidence around the impact that chronic loneliness has on health. It increases our risk of premature mortality, of coronary heart disease, stroke, the progression of frailty. There is a lot of strong evidence around the relationship between loneliness and mental health. And we know that loneliness is not a mental health issue in itself, but there's a two-way relationship in that having one can cause or contribute to the likelihood of having the other. And in particular, we're talking about depression and anxiety here. And there's a similar two-way relationship between loneliness and cognitive decline and dementia. And that's probably linked to the reduced social stimulation that either being lonely or having cognitive impairment can mean. And there's even evidence that loneliness and low social interaction are predictive of suicide in later life. So how do we explain these? These pathways are complex. I see you're on the next slide. And there's three key ways that have been proposed. First, behavioural mechanisms, which feeling lonely almost all the time makes us take less care of ourselves, basically. And we often get motivation to be healthy from our friends and family. So if that's lacking, that can be a real issue. In terms of psychology, we know it's associated with lower self-esteem, poor use of coping mechanisms, poor sleep. Physiologically, it's linked to blood pressure and a reduced immune function. So this impacts on our next slide, please. This impacts on health and care use. People who are lonely, chronically lonely, who have an impact on their health will make greater use of services. But we also know from service use data that people who are lonely visit their GPs more often, have more emergency admissions and are more likely to move into long-term care even after you've taken their health and care needs into account. So loneliness has an independent risk factor these use of services. There's obviously a related cost attached to this, as well as the miscontributions that people who are lonely miss from what they can contribute to society. Next slide, please. So hopefully I've summarised the importance of quality relationships for health and well-being and the impact that chronic loneliness can have on our health. We also know that there's all sorts of avenues of support and intervention with evidence that we can draw on from research and practice that help people. So what we think this tool can do is really help practitioners recognise loneliness in the people that they care for and apply the simple interactions that Chris has talked about to help people rebuild their social connections and find meaningful engagement 
in the course of the everyday interactions that they have with people. This is really about providing holistic care. It's particularly important sort of during and after the pandemic when social networks and support have been so limited. So thank you very much for listening. I'm going to finish now and hand back to Simon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalpa. Really powerful. With time ticking along, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Gay. As I said, that social prescribing link workers have been one of the best interventions or changes in, in my career because it's really helping my patients with yeah. tackling the social determinants of health. If I could hand over to Gay and, and welcome and thank you to you also for your perseverance. Hi everyone, thank you very much. As Simon said, my name's Gay Palmer. I am a social prescriber who works in South Southwark in South East London. I'm also on the board of trustees of the National Association for Social Prescribing. And as everyone's talking about, it's looking at the connection between how social prescribers can really help support dealing with loneliness and social isolation. So as you can see that loneliness is a national issue and we've recognised that it has been a key issue, especially during the pandemic. We've noted that 7.2% of adults reporting loneliness between October 2020 to February 2021. We've also noted that the impact of loneliness is not only just on the physical, but it's also on the mental health, which is obviously a significant aspect. Loneliness is just more than a sense of isolation. It is associated with an increased mortality risk for both men and women Lonely individuals are at higher risk of an onset of a disability and loneliness puts an individual at a greater risk of a cognitive decline. There's also been known that health costs and local services related to loan costs and an estimated £6,000 per person for a decade of an older person's life. Loneliness related to ill health and sick days is estimated to cost UK employers £2.5 billion every year. So you can see that this is quite a significant problem. And it's really interesting. I was listening to a, a podcast and said that sometimes you can be in a crowd of people and still feel lonely, which is actually quite striking and significant when I thought about it in honesty. And next slide, please. So again, I'm looking at the local perspective within Southwark as my role of a social prescriber. And as a social prescriber, it's really about connecting individuals to activities and services that can best suit them. And what we noticed was it wasn't just the elderly during this pandemic that were being referred, it was people of working age. So a lot of people now working from home, didn't have the same travel, didn't have the same work networks, wouldn't just pop out with friends for dinner in the evening. So all of a sudden they were at home more. So that increased their level of loneliness. It's also with children being away from their friends, not having the regular contacts, not being able to go to the park. They also became increasingly lonely. We also had a lot of new parents who were isolated from family, but not being able to go to parenting groups and access other people, but also language barriers as well, we found were quite significant in terms of um, the impact of loneliness, social isolation. We also recognise there was an impact of the digital technology. Now for some, this has helped some people amazingly maintain a level of connection and develop new relationships. However, for some, we felt that it actually isolated them more. And despite the befriending and the use of digital technology, the actual loss of the physical presence and the human connection significantly impacted on them. I recall a lady who was 72 who's referred to me and she had lots of several different problems going on. And every time we tried to support, we brought in befrienders, we brought in so many services. And she said to me, but Gay, you're not understanding you can have as many befrienders, you can all talk to me on the phone, but I just need someone here to talk to me so that I can feel like I'm being heard and I'm being listened to. And despite several services actually supporting this lady, unfortunately, she did sadly pass away. So then it just shows you the impact that despite all the services we're putting in place, she still felt that she wasn't having that real necessary connection and physical presence. We've also found that from the referrals from our GPs, there's been an increase of recurring ailments, low mood, recurring problems going back to the GP that appears to be quite minor. But again, it's that question of what matters, what's actually going on. And if you take that time to have a conversation with the person, 
you find that there's a lot more going on and that's where social prescribing really helps. For some residents, they found that having someone on the end of the phone made the difference. So we had a lot of people who, after we had the first conversation, they were like, actually, I feel really good now. I don't need any more kind of contact or support. So you find that loneliness and isolation can affect people very differently. And it's really having those conversations with people to find out what it is that's making them lonely. How can we best help them? For some residents, it did require more conversations about their concerns and worries and taking that time to explore. So we know that with the surgeries, GPs and professionals are very pressed on time. That's the difference with social prescribing. Our initial contact is actually up to 45 minutes. So in that 45 minute conversation, I can almost get the whole of a life story depending on who you talk to. But it also gives me this opportunity to really develop a relationship with a person because sometimes I'm a new person to them. They're like, who am I gonna to talk to? What can that person help me with? So it's developing a level of trust with an individual to find out what really matters to them. And we find sometimes with a referral, it can be food and something else that comes upon the referral. But until we spend time with that person, we don't really understand what matters to them. And that's where social prescribing is really important. Next slide, please. So how can social prescribing help? Social prescribing, as I said before, connects people to the community as a support through link workers. Um, some are known as GP navigators, community navigators. We have lots of different names, but it really is supporting an individual. And the focus is person-centered, what matters to that person. As I said before, the link workers, we have time so we can focus on what matters. We can take a holistic approach. So it may not just be their finances, but we can find out are there activities they enjoy? What is it that we can help to draw them and engage them more and look into their whole well-being? We can connect people to community groups, sources of advice, practical emotional support, access a range of activities typically provided by the voluntary community sector organisations. For many people, these activities offer people with a chance to socialise with others from their community. And that's the beauty of a community. It is very diverse. This can include volunteering, dance groups, choirs, gardening, befriending, cookery, health walks, other physical activities. For some of our new mums, it was parenting classes online. But in essence, what it's also about, it's also helps people to have fun, to build friendships and get more control over their health, to manage their needs in a way that suits them. It's really funny, I've started to do running and I quite enjoy it and I run on my own, but it's quite funny. The same people run every morning and every morning we say hello. We don't know each other, but even then it's a sense of community. We can see that there is something common that we're doing. So although we're running on our own and it seems like we're isolated, there is a connection and that's what's really important. A national response, social prescribing, is that link workers are becoming an integral part of the primary care network. And it's also a part of the five year framework for the GP contract reforms, and which is also a part of the Network Direct Enhanced Service contract for 2021. It's also a part of the long term plan of NHS England, which is about building the infrastructure for social prescribing to be within primary care. The idea is that we should have 1,000 new social prescriber link workers in place by 20, 2020 21, and significantly more to be increased, with at least 900,000 people across this country being referred to social prescribing by 2023-24. The National Academy of Social Prescribing was established in 2019 to advance social prescribing through promotion, collaboration and innovation. Some of the things that NASP are actually doing, we've funded 37 community projects for up to £50,000 through the Thriving Communities Fund to help build social prescribing activities within the local communities that have been most impacted by COVID. So this includes in Leeds, there's been various things like Space 2, which is working with Yorkshire Cricket Foundation, the Feel Good Factor, which is about promoting the social prescribing programme to de deliver activities that tackle social isolation, improving wellbeing and supporting communities. And as you can see on there, there's other things like the Helix Art and Thriving Communities in Bristol, which are also doing enabling people to be part of art groups, and art sessions. And as you can see, someone said, I joined because I was isolating myself through depression. So this gave me a chance to gain confidence, getting back out and socialising. It has made me happier. Next slide, please. We're also working with the South Bank Centre to exhibit art by 600 pieces. 
artwork are being created during the lockdown and there will be a new nationwide exhibition to highlight all of this. We're also supporting the other government work that's tackling loneliness by working with the Tackling Loneliness Network, which is made up of over 80 organisations across the public, private and charity sector. So supporting people experiencing loneliness by sharing and promoting resources and best practice examples of social prescribing through webinars, events and ambassador programmes. And the last slide, that's how you can make contact with the National Association for Social Prescribing, who can give you more advice and sign to more local organisations who are doing all of this amazing work as social prescribers. And that's me done. Simon, it's back over to you. Thank you, Gay. That was absolutely brilliant. With the ticking hand of time, unfortunately, we're not going to have uh, time for any more questions and answers. Although Chris did splendidly in, in covering whilst we were sorting technical uh, solutions. Because of that, the speakers have kindly agreed to support working with the team. And we will put out to you a sort of FAQ of the questions that were asked. We will also share the videos that were uh, shared because I know that different people's Wi-Fi means that sometimes people can hear and sometimes not and that they were really powerful videos. Uh, I would also again like to remind you of the fabulous e-learning for healthcare module that our speakers have contributed to and have worked so closely with our population health team. Loneliness and social isolation module is really good. I found it really helpful. Can I thank you, the audience, for joining and for persevering with the technical difficulties. Thank our speakers for doing the same. You were all brilliant. And actually the team that have been working so hard behind the scenes. I also just want to say before finishing, I'm aware that this may touch a nerve for some of us, that you may yourselves be lonely or be now thinking about family members or friends. Please do consider the resources that are available for HEE colleagues. The Employee Assistance Programme is absolutely brilliant and there's a lot on offer. There's a huge amount of resources on the Wellbeing Hub. And again, the NHS People site's got others. But if you are in distress, please do seek out help. Your general practice has got huge amounts of resources, not just the GP, but huge amounts of colleagues that could help, especially as Gay has so splendidly shown the social prescribing link worker. I think we need to all think a bit about the stigma of the language. When I talk about suicide, I'm very careful to talk about death by suicide rather than committing. And I think sometimes we talk about suffering from loneliness and that may make it harder for people to speak up. Uh, and say that they're lonely. One a really useful tip that Chris gave me was to ask what matters to you. Often we say, what's the matter with you? What matters to you is a much more important question. And can I just say also, as we've touched on a few times today, uh, we, many of us feel distanced and detached from colleagues because of our remote working. Might each of us consider whether there's one of our colleagues that isn't speaking up, may not have the camera on when we're on a Teams call. And it might be time to have a coffee and a chat with that person remotely while we have to, but maybe in person when we can. Stay safe. Please look after yourselves. Please look after each other. And please do look at the e-learning for healthcare module because it is absolutely brilliant. And I guarantee you will learn from it. Have a good afternoon, everybody. And thank you again. <laughs>